our series on worship. If you're uh, reading along in the Rick Warren book, it's chapter 10. And uh, I want to make it relevant to us um, because I feel like this part is very um, important to, to us understanding what we do here in church and what we do with our lives. Um, worship is a word that's probably unique to the Christian faith, um, but it's, it's, uh, in English it's more, more general, taofeng. In Vietnamese it's more unique to the Christian faith. I think worship is very general to all religions, um, the word worship itself. And so, um, there we go. Uh, our worship is a little bit different than what people in the general population may understand to be worship. If you look at the Vietnamese people and our culture, the three main religions or the two main religions that you can see besides Christianity is um, Buddhism and um, ancestor worship. It's where uh, you guys will probably, um, we'll learn more about Buddhism on Saturday nights in our Bible study. But ancestor worship is the heart of um, people to honor their parents after they die. So they, um, they offer up foods um, and other things um, to their dead parents, belie believing that they would come back and eat of it or use the uh, money that you burn. Fake money, not real money. Um, so when we say the word worship, a lot of people have a lot of different ideas. And that's why I feel it's very important that we who worship God have a very clear understanding of worship, what we do and why we do it. Um, and the first difference that I want to, uh, I'm going to, this is just a review, but uh, the first difference, main difference that I want to um, to highlight for you, and this should be the foundation of your worship, is when you think about um, the uh, foundation or the reason for a lot of the worship that's out there, when people, um, you know, sacrifice foods or gong um, to their parents, um, when they uh, sacrifice foods to, um, for in the, in the religion of um, uh, worshiping Buddha, when they do all those things um, that uh, the worship calls for, the core reason is for personal benefit. It looks like it's very sacrificial. It looks like it's very devout. But what are the core reasons? And if you ask them, it is for what? It's the, to pray to their ancestors, to protect them, to bless them in their business. Um, if you ask um, uh, the other faith, when they offer up foods as sacrifice, um, whether it be a chicken or a mango or some fruit, um, you know, they want, um, they want an, a prayer to be answered. They're praying for something, uh, for a personal gain, a personal need. Um, or just even the other devout practices of Buddhism, as we will learn is to avoid a certain, um, you know, misery in life, um, to, be, to, to, uh, to, be, uh, to escape from the cycle of rebirth and reincarnation that they believe happens to us. So that alone affects uh, a lot of people's understanding of worship. And so sometimes they enter the church and their question that they ask is, what can God do for me? If I worship God, what can God do for me? Well, this morning, I want you to understand the heart of worship and everything that we do pertaining to worship, what you do up here, what you do in this church, what you do when you step outside of this church in your everyday life when we worship God. The heart of worship is surrender. And surrender is not a very popular word. Surrender is like what you do when you lose, when you don't have enough men to fight the battle and your enemy has defeated you, you surrender. A white flag is what you do when you, uh, you know, I don't know what games you play that you surrender. You don't get, sur you don't probably surrender. You just get killed in your games. But surrender is like a bad connotation. It just does not sound very good. But the true meaning that I want you to understand is to completely offer up or completely submit to God. That is the foundation that is the heart of what we do is submitting to God. And in the verses that you read, Paul, the Apostle Paul, summed it up in a couple of um, verses. And it's very concise. He says that 
By the love of God, I urge you to do what? To offer up yourself, not just your money, not whatever your time or, or whatever is left in your life that you want to offer in your God, but all of you, yourself, your whole body, your entirety, all of you as a living sacrifice to God. And he calls it what? He calls it rightful worship. He says that that's what you should do. That's what worship is at its right, rightful place. It is the offering or the surrendering of yourself completely to God. And so that is the heart of worship. And we're going to go into what that means and what it doesn't really mean. So first, let me tell you what it doesn't mean. Uh, surrendering is not uh, repressing your personality. A lot of people, again, because of the Asian influence of Buddhism, think that you should do away with eating meat, you should um, stop hating, you should stop loving, you should, what human being can stop, you know, anger, um, love, your natural emotions. So first, surrendering is not repressing who you are as a human being, as an individual that God created you. All of you have specific characteristics. Some of you are very quirky, and I like it. Um, some of you are very funny. You know, one time uh, we were all sitting at the dinner table, just the kids, and Mendak was just like talking gibberish. And I think some of us were like, oh, poor kid, he can't talk. Some of them were like, what's he saying? And then B says, your Spanish is dope, man. <laughs> and, and so I, I love that. That's just like funny guy. Um, and, I, and I like to laugh. So a lot of you are funny. A lot of you are serious and very quiet. And that's fine, too. That's who you are. And the things that you like to do, the, it's all you. You don't have to repress any of that um, to be submissive to God or to surrender to God. And surrendering to God is not passive resignation or fatalism. Now, these are big words, so let me explain that, what that means. It means that, you know, uh, well, God has decided that blah, blah, blah. That is actually not submission or surrender. That's actually a dissatisfaction against God. God, from the very beginning, gave us free will. Um, from Adam and Eve, he gave them the right to believe in God or to believe in the serpent. And they made their choice, and we know what they chose. All of us is the same way. We have our choices every day. God did not, you know, set out anything for you that you have to do that you don't want to do in your life. Certainly in your life, God will arrange, open up opportunities, close some doors, and that's God's work in your life. But it's uh, to think that, oh, because God made it that way, uh, that's kind of like fatalism. And you're like resigned to your fate. Um, no, that is not surrender. That's actually dissatisfaction against God. And then the third one is excuse for laziness. Um, let me turn to the verse that we just read. Um, a lot of people, and the, the question last night about the guy on the boat and numerous people uh, try to rescue him from the flood and he said nope I'm waiting for God to rescue me he had very poor common sense uh, and this is what this is what Paul says um, therefore I urge you brothers and sisters in view of God's mercy to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice holy and pleasing to God this is your true and proper worship do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to do what? Be a zombie and do what exactly what, uh, you know, uh, Kofung says? No. It says, then you will be able to test. Test means you got to try it out. Think about it. Think critically. What does that make? Does that make sense? Then you will be able to test and approve of what God's will is, his good and pleasing and perfect will. Those who, don't, those who say that, well, I don't have to worry about tomorrow. I don't need to get a job or anything because God's going to take care of me. They, they have not understand the will of God, and they haven't tested 
um, what's, what God's will for them is. And so it's not an excuse for laziness. Total submission and surrender to God is not an excuse to not worry about any aspect of your life because God is going to take care of it. So that's what surrender is not. Surrendering to God at its core, in its a true meaning, is when we love God. Uh, we um, love God because God loves us. We understand how much God loves us, and now we want to love God back by giving all of who we are to God. Now, what does that mean, really? Um, surrender is obeying God daily. Everybody say it, obeying God daily. And there's an, uh, there's an acronym for you to remember, OGD. Who's heard of OCD? Oh, okay, a lot of you have heard of OCD. OCD is you're like obsessed with something and you have to do it. Like some people who are OCD about germs wash their hands like 50 times a day and like carry around the um, alcohol rub and like drink it too. I'm just kidding. Um, but OCD people have to do something very compulsively all the time, every single day. I want you to think of it not as in a compulsive way, but obeying God all the time, every day. There is a moment of surrender where you make that important decision that I will believe in Jesus Christ. I will commit to serving him. I will um, worship him. That is the moment of surrender. Then there is the practice of surrender where you do it every day. And what do you do? Um, here is something I want to clarify. A lot of people say, well, I want to obey God, but what is God's will? He didn't send me a text or an email. What am I supposed to know uh, about God's will? Well, actually, he did send you a text. It's a very large text. But still, a lot of people read the Bible, and they're confused about God's will. And one of the confusion is like every single aspect of your life. Um, you have to seek out God's will. Um, and, you know, when I was young, I was like that too. I was like, what is God's will for me for my career? What, like some people ask you, what do you want to do when you grow up? What do you want to be when you grow up? So I, I tell you that is something you shouldn't ask. Because why? Now I tell people who ask me that, whatever you like to do. If you want to be a doctor, you like to take care of people, go into the medical field. If you like to sit and punch on the keyboard, do something with the computer. Whatever you like to do. It's actually a not, not a moral decision. There's no right or wrong, good and evil in what you do. But now uh, I see that um, it's, a, it's actually you know, something that we shouldn't confuse ourselves with. And so I, I told you, you know, when I was going through school, I uh, finally came to the realization that, you know, it probably doesn't matter what I do, what I study. And so I probably told you this before, but when I went through school, I prayed that God, please let me get into pharmacy school. Um, then I'll be a pharmacist. If not, I'll be a petroleum engineer. Because I drive around town and there's a bunch of oil rigs, I was like, well, <clears throat> the important thing to me is that when I graduate, I get a job because I will have a lot of student loan and a lot of debt. So I saw those oil rigs and I said, well, if I don't make it to pharmacy school, uh, I think I'll do petroleum engineering because there's sure to be a lot of oil around here. Um, you know, and so some things we don't need to confuse ourselves and make it that complicated. So, you know, right now, <clears throat> I would encourage you <clears throat> if what, what people, when people ask you, what do you want to be or what, what do you want to do when you grow up? Well, when you grow up, you want to serve God. And what do you want to be? You want to be a good and faithful servant of God. And that job that you're going to do that, that you like doing, that's going to help you serve God and be a faithful servant to God. So some things we don't need to confuse ourselves too much about. Just do what you like. As long as it's not a sin, it's okay. But what do we mean by obeying God daily? Here is the important part, and you know this is when you have to decide to obey God. It's when you have a choice of doing what you want to do, but is not the same as what God wants you to do. So from what you read from the Bible, um, you know, uh, and everything that you learn from the Bible, 
um, uh, do not be controlled by anger, get rid of all malice, um, you know, love your neighbor, all those things that we learn all the time on Saturday night Bible study and on Sunday. And then now you have a choice to either be angry at someone or to cuss them out or whatever it is. When you have a choice and it's not the same as what you know that God wants you to do, then pick that choice. Obey God. That is surrendering to God. When there are two choices, what you want to do and what God wants you to do, and they don't jive, they uh, they conflict with each other, then obey God. And do it daily, and it will become a practice of surrendering to God in uh, in the everyday of your life. Um, And so the second thing I put on there is waiting on God patiently. This also is a form of surrendering or submitting to God. Now, what does this uh, waiting on God patiently mean? It means like when you want to do something, you feel like um, uh, it's, you feel like you need to do it because you're, you've been violated or somebody's done you wrong and you need to take back what they owe you, take back whatever it is that they violated you for don't. Why? God said, revenge is mine. Our, our command, what God wants us to do, is to love our neighbors. So in those situations, don't and wait patiently on God. Because when you do, when you surrender whatever that situation is to God, you offer it up to God, you are saying to God, I trust you. I trust that you are a righteous God, and you will make everything right. That's what waiting on God patiently means in your life. So, again, first one is when you have a choice, and what you want to do does not, is not the same as God wanted, wants you to do, then pick what God wants you to do. Second, when somebody has done something wrong to you, and you feel like, um, you need to take back something. You need to, uh, you know, get, uh, get back. Don't. Wait on God. That is surrendering to God. And then thirdly, I put undivided. Because a lot of you, for the adult uh, Vietnamese service, is actually a different word. It's actually money. But I put undivided here because um, who's working right now? Yeah, and even when you're working, you don't need to pay the house bill, the car bill, and all those things. So for you, uh, I put undivided, but really it's money um, for the adults because everybody, everybody's choices of surrender will be tested by something. And for a lot of adults, it's money. You're either going to serve God, submit to God, or you're going to submit to money uh, or making money and making more money. Um, And so for you, I put undivided because at your age, there's a lot of things that gets your attention, that wants to dominate your life, eat up your time, consume your mind, fill up your heart. And so Jesus Christ said, you cannot be the servant of two masters. You cannot serve God and money at the same time. I would tell you, you cannot serve God, submit to God, surrender to God, and then also submit to Fortnite, Roadblock, whatever it is that dominates your life. Whatever it is, and it could be something good like love. You know, maybe you're in love and you're infatuated and whatever. It's fine. People, uh, God gave us love so that we would, you know, start families and uh, get married and have kids. But anything that dominates your life stops you from uh, surrendering completely to God. So surrendering is completely undivided submission, undivided offering of yourself to God. Nothing else is going to control you have dominance in your life over over God. So surrendering is obeying God daily, OGD. Uh, Say it, obey God daily. If you don't remember anything from today, you're going to remember to obey God daily. 
Um, and then I want to tell you, um, let me um, skip this and go to the third one. What you can expect when you surrender to God. Um, first, you can expect peace. A lot of people have a misunderstanding that when life doesn't go their way, when things go wrong, um, you know, situations suck, and when people are, like, against them, they think it's the situation or the person. But they don't realize that they are fighting and their struggle is against God. And so when you surrender or submit your life to God and obey God, you're first going to get peace, a kind of peace that um, Paul says that this world cannot provide you. And that's why a lot of Christians, even in the midst of pandemic or whatever, all kinds of situations in our life, like I said, we're okay because we have that peace uh, from God. And then the second thing you're going to get is freedom. And none of us are slaves. Who is a slave? I, I know you're a slave to something, but um, all of us are free. So you're probably wondering, uh, what is freedom? What is this freedom that we're going to get? This is a freedom from sin. And you're thinking, well, I'm not enslaved to sin. Um, well, when you, um, if you don't submit to God, you're going to be, like I mentioned, dominated by something else in your life. And so whatever dominates you, and usually you can get away from playing Fortnite. You can stop, um, you know, whatever it is that you're doing. But sin captures and enslaves people. There are things in this life that um, enslave people that are sinful. And whether they want to or, or not, they cannot get away. And so here's a, here's a common misconception. A lot of people think that becoming a Christian, you're going to lose all kinds of freedom because, you know, the, the Ten Commands are like, do not, thou shalt not, thou shalt not, do not, do not, do not, do not, do not. And they're like, oh, that's a lot of lost freedom. But actually, Christians are the most freest people in the world because we understand we have choice with our God, our Father, and then we are free from the captivity of sin or bad things that dominates our minds and dominates our hearts. And so second, you will receive freedom. And then the third thing, which I want to spend a little bit time on, is you will experience God's power. And so what does this mean? A lot of people um, have it also backwards with this. And why do they um, have it backwards? Usually Christians pray like for something, and then they expect God to answer their prayer, right? Who's done that? Well, uh, in a lot of situations, God is actually waiting for you to act. And here, let me tell you a true story that happened recently. So you know Ethan records our, um, our, sermon, our sermons, our services, and my mom sends it to like people in Australia, people in um, Vietnam, people in Europe. And so when uh, Go Jang was announcing that we were fixing the breakfast room and we're raising funds, uh, someone from Vietnam actually uh, offered some money to help fix our, our, um, our breakfast room. And it kind of tickled me inside, made me kind of chuckle, because I remember the days when we were raising money to help build churches in Vietnam. And now the people in Vietnam are, like, uh, sending money for us to uh, restore our church. So I thought that was kind of um, very funny. But I actually, I am very touched, because in Vietnam, especially after the pandemic, People are struggling a lot financially. And I know there are a lot of rich, rich, very rich, a lot of people in Vietnam who are rich are even richer than the people in America. Uh, she is not one of those rich people. So I was very impressed. So I decided to call her to say thank you and to, you know, encourage her. And because I was really impressed that she um, made the offering to help us restore the church. And she told me, this is what she told me. She said that, you know what? When I heard her calling, um, you know, I felt God urging me to donate that money um, to help restore the church. And I didn't have a whole lot, but I, 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 I heard God's calling and I wanted to donate, so I did. But just a couple of days later, 
a friend from America called me and she said she wanted to buy a piece of land. So I called my friend in Vietnam and told her, you know, she, she has a piece of land for sale. And so the transaction went through, this person bought the piece of land, this person sold this piece of land, and her friend said, hey, thanks for, thanks for connecting and making this sale happen. I want to give you a portion of the sale price, like a percentage. Um, you know how realtors make money now. And she said that, you know, the amount of money she got was more than she, she ever, like, uh, hoped for. And she said, that's not it. She said that over the past couple of years, God has provided for her just like that. She said that her profession is a seamstress. She, my, uh, she sews things, but like years and years of spending over the sewing machine, she had terrible backache and she was unable to sew anymore. And a couple years ago, she said that, God, if I can't sew anymore, what are we gonna do? She was the breadwinner in the family. Um, she made the money to keep the family, um, you know, to feed the family, and she couldn't sew anymore. But she said that, you know, time after time, situations just like that, God brought her enough money to sustain her for over a couple of years. And so I want you guys to turn to um, Psalms chapter 37. Um, Psalms chapter 37 is very popular for a verse um, that um, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. But we're not going to um, cover that verse. I'm going to actually read verse 3. Um, hold on. I'm in the book of Job. Psalms chapter 37. Um, I'm still in the book of Job. Psalms chapter 37. Uh, verse 3, it says, Trust in the Lord and do good, meaning do what is right. Dwell in the land and enjoy safe pasture. Um, and it says, commit, in verse 5, commit your way to the Lord, trust in him, and he will do this. And so you remember the Saturday night Bible study, and uh, he said that, or Lee said that, you know, why don't we prioritize God first? And she said that when you go to church, you have no money. When you go to work, you have money to eat, you know. But I want you to start thinking this way. It's very practical, and a lot of people think that way. But as Christians, we need to start thinking the way of complete trust, which is surrender to God. We will dwell in the land based on our trust in God. We will live by our trust in God. And when you do, you will start to experience God's power in your life. You will see him do things that you never expect. But until you start trusting and doing, like she said that if she didn't make that that offering, she know for sure she wouldn't receive that from the sale of the land. But because she did, God blessed her with that. She said that a lot of Christians um, in Vietnam, and I think over here too, you know, they pray and they expect God to do something for them. And they never think that God is waiting for them to act by faith. And so surrendering means you act in complete trust in God. And when you do, you will experience God's power in your life. Now, I want to conclude with this. What stops you from surrendering to God? And I put fear and pride, very common words. Um, the first one being fear. Um, you know, I, uh, I've been a pastor for a while, and one time I spoke with a lady. She was, re she was new, and she had just been coming to our church for um, maybe over a year. And she says that, you know, in her life, there's a lot of things that's going wrong with her, you know, her husband, her family, um, her husband's cheating on her. And, she's, and when she said that when I get scared, I pray to God, but I also pray to Buddha. Uh, she says that when she gets really scared, she cannot stop um, praying to Buddha and just pray to God alone. She prays to both. And it made me think, you know, a lot of people are fearful to trust in God. Why? Because they don't fully understand how much God loves them. I think if we understood how much God loves us, that he would give Everything he had, and he has much more than us, being God, trust me. He has more than that laptop that you have. 
uh, he has the whole world and even beyond this world. But he gave all of that up and he gave everything, including his own life, to save us so that we can come to him. What wouldn't he give us? What wouldn't he do for us? Why wouldn't he take care of us with his overwhelming love? He would. And I think um, if people knew that, and people knew that um, for sure, if they read the Bible, if they start to understand how much God loves us, that fear would go away. And that fear would be replaced by trust in God. But the reality is a lot of people put fear um, in front, and it stops them from trusting in God and surrendering to God completely. And as a result, they never see God's power in their life. And so fear. And then second is pride. And I put pride here. It's actually thinking about yourself. It's not like people who are arrogant or anything. I know a lot of us um, may not be arrogant, but a lot of us think about me first. And that's where... I started out with, you know, some people think, what can God do for me? And that for sure 100% will stop anyone from surrendering to God. So in your life, you're going to have some things that you want to do, that you want to accomplish. And don't make the mistake of putting that first. Whatever it is that you want to do, submit it to God. And you know what? If God says, no, that's not what I want you to do in your life, are you going to be okay with it? Total submission to God and surrendering to God is when you say, God, if that's not what you want, I'm okay with it. So whatever it is that you want, it's not a bad thing. I don't think any of you want to grow up to be bank robbers or murderers or whatever. You all want good things. But even then... Be undivided. Give that over to God. Place God first. Submit to God and obey God first. And not what you want. Um, not a me first mentality. And I want to conclude with this um, fabulous picture. Who knows? Who has ever seen this film? It's the original. Uh, I call it the original. I'm pretty sure there was an earlier Jesus film. But I, uh, when I went to Daiho, I, I saw some people that I haven't seen since 1983 when we were living in the refugee camp together. Um, so it's very special to see people that you, um, like when I was a kid and we were very close. Um, but I remember in refugee camp, they showed the Jesus film. And the Jesus film was made in 1978-1979 by a man named Bill Bright. And according to the Guinness World Record, no other movie has been translated in so many languages. The Jesus Film Project has been translated to over 1,700 and uh, like 1,700 languages. So people around the world have seen the Jesus Film in their own language. So I remember watching it in refugee camp. I don't remember what language it was. It was probably Vietnamese, since all of us are Vietnamese. But in addition, Bill Bright um, wrote um, the four, the, it's a tract, so it's small, the four spiritual laws. And people estimate that between the Jesus Film Project, translated in over 1,700 languages, and his, um, and his writing, over 150 million people have come to Jesus Christ, have known Jesus Christ and trusted in Jesus Christ. 150 million people in the world have come to know Jesus Christ, are saved because of what one man did. So if you read the book or you listen to it, um, Rick Warren asked Bill Bright, what is it? Why did God do such enormous things in your life? Tell me what it was. And Bill Bright said that when he was younger, probably maybe around your age. Um, also, Bill Bright started Campus Crusade for Christ, which is now called Crew. He said when he was younger, he made a contract, and he literally wrote it out, and it was very simple. He said that he, from now on, will be a slave for Jesus Christ until we completely surrender 
all of us, not holding anything back from God, we can't see the great, awesome things that God has planned for our lives. That's why Paul says that offer yourself to God and then you will know the good and perfect will of God. Unless we do, we won't experience those things. We won't experience God's greatness in our lives and what God has planned, which is good and perfect um, and his will for us in our lives. Please stand up. And this morning, if you want to make a decision to surrender to Jesus Christ, to love him, to worship him, and you haven't before, please step out and step up and I will help you pray. To receive Jesus Christ as your God, your Savior, your Lord, and your Master. And if you have already, and you're already baptized, then decide today that you will live for nothing else, no one else, not your personal agenda, not what you want, but you will live to obey God daily. Please uh, close your eyes, and we'll come to the Lord in prayer. Dear God, our Heavenly Father, God, we thank you so much for showing us um, in tangible ways how much you love us, God, by coming, becoming human and showing who you are, God, and dying for us on the cross to take our sins upon yourself and pay that penalty for us. Uh, God, we thank you and we pray in the name of Jesus Christ that every individual here, God, is touched by your love. And God, I pray, Holy Spirit, that you work in our hearts so that every day that we live, we learn to submit to you, Holy Spirit. We learn to listen to your voice. We learn to remember the things that you have taught us and live by the, your truth, God. And God, please forgive us when we failed you. By the blood of Jesus Christ on the cross, we know we are forgiven and we will rise again to live and to walk firmly in the road and in the path, in the narrow path that you have set before us, uh, us God. The path of faith in you, the path of trust in you. And God, I pray in the name of Jesus Christ that your power and your glory uh, will be displayed in us, God. Um, uh, even at, at this young age, God, I pray that you call out to these young individuals to live completely surrendered to you and devote their life, their time, um, and their energy and who they are, God, to loving you, to worshiping you, to doing the things that you have commanded us to do, God. In Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. I love you, Lord. And love of God, the grace and forgiveness of Jesus Christ, and the unity of the Holy Spirit be with each of us until we see you again. Amen. Remember, Vacation Bible School is July 24th. Um,